TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. Right behind me. You see it? Just a little warning, just in case. You never know. Twitch.com is where you can catch a live stream, man. Username's at the bottom of the screen. Patreon. Don't forget we got one. That's what we don't watch the same stuff that we watch on YouTube. It's a whole different vibe over there. We watch series. We watch UK movies, UK series, and Premier League highlights, man. <clears throat> Link to all of that is out in the description, man. This is, uh, let me see, Jimmy the Giant. The official YouTube channel, Jimmy the Giant. This is the first time I'm watching. Somebody suggested Jimmy the Giant in the Discord, and he actually got a lot of UK stuff on his channel. Low key, salute to Jimmy the Giant. The UK, where officials are. I'm mad I'm late to the party. Remember, if you see your stuff on my channel as a reaction and you don't want it there, just leave a comment and I will take it off, man. You don't got to do all that extra goofy stuff. Just, just leave a comment, I'll take it off. Simple as that, but. Let's get into it. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. Dealing with a recent surge of knife crime. At the first time I got stabbed nine times, and then the second time I got stabbed nine times. There were 14,000. A recent surge? When was that? <laughs> Wait, when was that news? Uh, when did that get broadcasted? And knife related incidents in London. As of lately, the UK has become synonymous with this image of rising knife crime. Knives, 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 knives. We see these police pictures of some of the weapons they seize. It's like a Counter Strike loot box. But today I want to peek past the headlines and talk about how bad is this problem. I've actually seen Jimmy the Giant before, actually, on t TikTok or something. Really? And are the politicians and pundits that like to talk about shorts about this a lot? Lawless Britain is in full swing. Are they helping or are they making the problem worse? Today we're going to explore the UK's knife crime epidemic. It's not just a black issue. It's not just a London issue. It's a nationwide issue and it's growing. That's a fact. <laughs> Like, that's a fact. You know how in America you can pinpoint gun violence? You can kind of be like, oh, no, it's a black issue. I ain't even gonna cap. But, like, in the UK, you can't do that with that issue. It's everybody. Everybody chefing stuff out there. It's tough. It get tough. You know, like, doing that really make you a different type of person, too. It changes you. Wielding a knife and actually using it, it changes you because you got to get up close and personal. You got to hear stuff. You got to see stuff. You're going to hear bones break. You're going to, it's gory. You see a different type of person at the, an altercation like this. Well, I'm just going to lay my cards out here. I get a little bit annoyed about how London and the UK is framed. The media make it out as though if you want to go to a Greg's Baker, you have to have a jewel to get in. The wholesale carrying of weapons that can kill another human being reached an appalling level. And I'm interested to know, do you feel safe? There was a single month in 2017 where London had a higher murder rate than New York City. I'm like, yeah, that, that's very believable. Very believable. Kind of the same laws. New Yorkers carry knives too. They also got guns, but they don't use them as much because, you know, you get caught with a blick, you use a blick in, in, in uh, New York, you're going to jail for like, 15 years, you get caught with one. I, I'm just throwing a number. I think like 10, at, the, at least. So they more <laughs> use it more sparingly. They don't, you know. That sounds pretty bad. Fox News reported on this. They said, London murder rate beats New York for month a stabbing sir. Now this right here, this right here, the news be perpetuating stuff. I know them young boys in Chicago, they see a headline like this. They might go throw a party. They might go throw a party. A Fifi. They gonna throw a block party. It's up. They're celebrating. So to give it like... 
to crown them like this is crazy. The media don't even be knowing what they be doing when they put statistics out and they start keeping records and they start publicizing them. Like, boy, you are you are doing something to them young boys. They want the crown for this stuff. Yeah, I, I just want to bring the temperature down a little bit. So in this month that they're talking about, London had 22 murders as opposed to New York's 21. And this was being betrayed. As though fucking samurais had overtaken London. But it was a massive example of misrepresenting a problem. The real story here was that New York had actually done a fantastic job at reducing homicides. If we look at how bad it was, it does sound like a fantastic job by New York. Was, and then where it ended up, this is a brilliant story. This is like a good news story. But instead of Fox going, hey, look, well done, New York. You guys are doing great. We're nearly as low as Europe. Instead, they reported it like London had surged in knife crime, when in reality, knife crimes had stayed the same. I recently read a story that in London, which has unbelievably top gun laws, they say it's as bad as a military war zone. And this story pisses me off because... Excuse me? I ain't never heard that. I, I, I did never. New York obviously returned to overtaking London. And if we just compare London and England to, I don't know, America, that has a city called St. Louis where it... Mm, that's not the city you want to compare. They're number one. <laughs> They're at the top of the food chain right there. Its murder rate is 60.9 per 100,000 people. And London's worst year ever was 1.7 per 100,000 people. Now, that isn't to say that the UK doesn't have a knife crime problem. Is it this absolute war zone? No, but we do have a problem. And we have to ask, where did this knife crime come from? Jimmy the Giant. I like how you're doing this. You know what this is? So if y'all ever pay attention to documentaries or, or like me, like y'all be thinking I'd just be watching, but I'd be breaking down in my mind how they're done. They're done like essays in school. Do you remember essays in school? You got to come with a compelling introduction that draws the audience in. That was it. <laughs> you got to have a body that explains start, middle, and finish. I'm pretty sure it's going to have. And in conclusion, you got to say something monumental. And, and it can, that's all documentaries do. They're essays, but just put into a motion form. And if you're good at writing essays, you can be good at this 100%. And I'm good at writing essays, low key. Did I like to do them? No, but I can do them. I understand what's needed. Be prepared, man, for the content switch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My bad. Jimmy the Giant just sparked something. Every 14 minutes, there's a knife crime across England and Wales. It's happening so often to the point where people are fearing for their lives every single day. So let's do the thing that we do when we go back in time, right? Let's go back to pre-war Britain and try and get an understanding of what murder was like in this first period. period of time. Oh, murder. The data on murder from this period of time is a little bit sketchy. Did every single murdered prostitute from the slums get recorded? You know, PC plod just with his little notebook. It's getting a bit full. Is it worth the paperwork? Who knows? Probably not. However, with, you know, a massive fucking handful of salt, we do have some statistics. The government has data on 1901 to 2018 and the homicide rate. And it appears that murder was in fact lower than it was in the 90s to 2000s. And you, might you remember in the, what, for essays when you had to um, get the facts in the essays and then write the facts in the on a separate piece of paper on where you cited them from? You just do it. Instead of in, a, in a, an essay form, you do it separately. You just do it as you go in a, in a, in a documentary or something like this. I'm telling y'all, I've been doing this so long. Like, I, I, yeah, I, like, there's little things I've been picked up on, man. Telling ya. I'd be wondering, what the fuck? The slums of London, with the, the piss and the poo, there was less murder. Why is that? You may be wondering. Well, don't worry, I will tell you. The public feel crime is increasing and the police are doing nothing about it. The police feel the public couldn't care less. The most interesting period of time to look at is the 60s. From the 60s, we notice that the murder rate just starts growing and, and growing. 
and grow it. Now, we don't have any data specifically on knife crimes. They didn't record it. It was just a murder's a murder. But we can assume from our knowledge about gangs in the past that, yeah, probably a few pokies were used. But what's also interesting is if we look at the gender divide. In this same sort of period, we see this dramatic split where men aged 15 to 44 started just fucking dropping like flies. So it is important for us to ask the question, what was happening in the 60s and why were men starting to just be killed more? Swinging London. Population control. London. Changing London. Down with the old, up with the new. Post World War II, the UK was rebuilding. And in this time, our culture massively changed. We would start to embrace a new type of individualism and consumerism. Largely thanks to the Americans and the advent of home TV, we could now sit at home and have adverts blasted into our retinas. Ooh, yeah, we do need a new sofa. What's that? A hat you can drink beer from? Like, look, I'm taking the piss. I used to want one of those bad. I don't know why. But this was a good period of time, in a way. Mickey and Barry and Bill and Stevie. The average bloke and his family, obviously, their living standards were growing at an incredible rate. However, with all this prosperity, there would be a consequence. Boys, I want to take a second here. About a month ago, I was on holiday in Croatia, and I thought I lost my wallet. But luckily... Salute to you, Jimmy the Giant. I understand you gotta pay the bills. Hopefully you can connect me with them so they can, so I can pay some bills. Until then. Anyway, back to the video. We collected data on problems with social gradients, the kind of problems that are more common at the bottom of the social ladder. And there you see it in relation to the measure of inequality I've just shown you. The more unequal countries doing worse on all these kinds of social problems. Generally speaking, it is understood that when inequality grows in society, the higher that crime and in turn murder, knife crimes, the higher that that will be. And generally speaking, this is true. But we need to take that with a bit of context. Now look bit of context for you. This chart here is really interesting. It shows us how inequality changed post-war. And you might be looking at this and going, hang on, it's really interesting. Income share percent total top 10 bottom 50 wealth distribution okay started high 60 percent the income share then it drops drastically the top 10 drops at least 30 percent now some of y'all don't know how to read a graph too it's just crazy <laughs> but if you was uh oh the, no this is the yeah yeah the bottom the, the top 10 drop and then the, the bottom 50% it had a it rose a little bit actually dropped again then rose it's been pretty much the same alright continue I just like to show that I pay attention in school sometimes you know it shows us how inequality changed post-war. And you might be looking at this and going, hang on a fucking second, Jimmy. You told me that when inequality is bigger, crime is bigger. But I'm seeing here, I'm seeing that the 60s and 70s, this is a time of low inequality. But what the fuck, man? Look at the crime. Now, this right here is where culture plays its role. So in this post-war period, there's a few things that are happening also, so you're having the rise of youth culture and subcultures. As laws have changed, etc., young people had more free time and they were no longer instantly destined for the mines. Slowly, our values were changing to mean if you're rich, you're cool. This is the same period of time where there's a rising celebrity culture. The film. I'm being honest, man, I don't think anybody that was rich is cool. <laughs> it's like, if you're born rich, I don't think you're cool. Like you can, you can, you can like be, you can develop coolness, but normally if you're born into money, like you are sheltered, you don't know nothing but money. You don't know nothing. You don't know real life. So he's like, you ain't that cool. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To the masses, you not that cool. You just a rich one. You just a rich lame. And I don't like to say cool and lame, but like I'm I'm saying it to get my point across. But like 
to the masses though. I'm talking about to the rest of the world. Like if somebody poor got around you, they would be like, oh, he got money. But then they get to know you and they'd be like, oh, you're not that. That's like a lot of large percentage of the time until you start to develop some type of character. You know what I'm saying? But like when when poor people get rich, they can they can turn into a holes, but like they already got character. They know what the bottom feel like, so they kind of you know they kind of like make rich look cool. But they don't, don't get me wrong, now anybody I would love to be rich. Films, the TV advertisements would reinforce this idea that in order to mean something to society, you needed stuff. You know, you need the nice clothes, you need the nice car, the shiny smile, the hot wife. But hang on a second, what if you had no stuff? You know, and what if you grew up in an area, like a kind of poorer area, where people around you didn't really have stuff? But your TV is telling you, you need stuff. Well, well, my friends, I have a solution. Sell drugs. Poverty isn't a thing that you're either in or not in. The individual people are sometimes above and sometimes below. Allegedly. Constantly. Sometimes above and sometimes below. Constantly verging on poverty. In this period of time, we were creating an underclass. A class of people that were left behind, growing up poorer in more deprived conditions. And when they looked around for role models, it would be people generally growing up in a similar situation in the same environment. And the bloke with the nice trainers, the car, the watch, the girls, and most importantly, respect. Yeah, exactly. Had made it and, and still in the neighborhood and showing you and coming around. <sighs> this guy gets it. <laughs> That was often the drug dealer. You see, as the United Kingdom was becoming more and more capitalist and more consumerist, obviously more industries were starting to pop up and develop. And a growing industry emerged around the illegal drug market, where you didn't need some degree or wear a dumb shirt and call people Mr. and Mrs. Okay, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Corporate Erin. I'm the manager for the manager of logistics for management McManagement. But it was a place that if you wanted to take the risk, you could make a lot of money very quickly. Just like society keeps telling you you need to do. And with that, from the 60s to the 90s, the murder rate and in turn, the knife crime rate would just keep going up. Chiefs, it really, yeah, just doesn't stop, does it? Fucking hell. It finally peaks in the UK in 2003 and then starts to decline. This same rise, if we track some different analytics, seems to follow trends of growing inequality, growing divorce rates, growing drug prosecutions, growing alcohol consumption, and growing child poverty. So this is really like the government politicians like they could easily like they have the same data that youtubers collect but they just ignore it <laughs> they use it as a political push then forget about it be helpful for us because it really paints a picture of how these changing economic situations and changing cultural values increase both crime and murder and amongst all of this growing murder there would be knife crime in 2023, Elaine Williams published this paper called Policing the Crisis in the 21st Century, The Making of Knife Crime Youths in Britain. I'll link that below. It's, it's a really good read. Check it out. And it explains to us something very interesting that the term knife crime really started to mainly appear for the first time in the early 2000s. And it was like portraying this brand new scary phenomena in England. But this term knife crime was an unofficial label and that sounds weird but just just think about it for a second what is knife crime is it a killing or is it a crime where a knife is present and maybe used to threaten someone or what if there was no so he's bringing a valid point so i ain't never really even thought that deep into it what is knife crime i'm i always uh i personally always uh assume it's not cr crime that involves a murder or a stabbing I didn't even think about it, like, the second part of what he said. No active crime, but a knife was found in someone's car. These are all technically knife crimes. And then, I'm going to get Jordan Peterson here. What, what do you mean, mean knife? Like, are we talking counter-strike knives, or are we talking, I don't know, a screwdriver? Is a screwdriver a knife? Is a piece of glass, like, from a bottle, a sharp object, is that a knife? Are we talking about gangsters in the street carrying knives? Are we talking about drunk husbands threatening their wife? These things, I have said, are all very different situations and circumstances, and they all have very different motives. The police 
until 2001 never used the term knife crime. The media did. 2001 would be the introduction of knife-enabled crime. This would be a tick box that police officers would check when a knife was involved. This definition included all sharp objects. So we're talking screwdrivers and broken bottles, glass. And this recording made no distinction between the motive of the crime. Whether it was a domestic abuse, whether it was a bar brawl, whether it was theft, whether it was SA, it didn't record the age or the ethnicity of the offender. The study claims that throughout what the media are labeling a knife crime epidemic, did I say Liverpool? The study claims that throughout what the media are labeling a knife crime epidemic, knife usage as a percentage of all violent crime consistently remained between 5% and 8% of all offenses. And why that's important is because it is very hard to say whether the use of a knife was any more or less common proportionately to all the homicides that have happened historically. But that, my friends, that doesn't sell as many newspapers as knife crime youths are on the rise. Yeah, okay. Clickbait. Everybody at this point should know the, the mainstream media uses clickbait by now with titles and things of that nature. Whatever going to draw your attention. How it, it, many teenagers? 16 this year alone what, in what, one what city. Needs to How? I love this lady. She be cursing people out. You could tell she's real passionate about what she be talking about. Up here. Brilliant, Many brilliant. before you get serious. Brilliant. On the 4th of November 2003, a 14-year-old lad by the name of Luke Walmsley was stabbed and killed in a rural school in Lincolnshire. This case sparked the conversation around knife crime as this kind of distinctly new concern for England and Wales. You'd have newspapers saying stuff like, there are an incredible number of youngsters who are willing to sign up to the knife culture and bring an offensive weapon into school. From here, newspapers started to report more and more about different knife crimes that involve. Now let's compare the knife, like this stuff, to Chicago, right? And I'm talking about inner city Chicago. I'm not talking about the Chicago suburbs. I'm not talking about the good magnet schools in Chicago. I'm talking about in the hood. <laughs> uh, they be bringing guns to school. There's metal detectors. They'll stash them in the bushes outside of school because when it when it's when it's a problem in school, they go get it out of school. Remember, you used to go to school and just get into a good old fashioned fist fight. That don't happen no more. Internet brought that around. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. Nobody's fighting, and this is you can even move this to outside of school. If you go into a fight in Chicago, I can't speak for no other town, but I can speak for Chicago. If you go into it thinking you're about to have a one-on-one -on -one fist fight, you're delusional. You're delusional. Like, if you get into an altercation over the phone with somebody or online or over text and you're like, okay, let's meet up and let's fight, that doesn't happen anymore. That's not a realistic thing. That somebody's bringing something, you're going to get jumped, you're going to get shot, you're going to... Something... That expectation is out the window. That's why there's a lot of knife crime. Uh, and, and Not knife crime, gun crime. Nobody's getting embarrassed on and putting on World Star. Involved young people. And this was painting a perception of this growing phenomena of knife crime amongst youth. And you can see this whole youth slant in this campaign here from 2005. It's called It's Not a Game. It's a great example of how they were trying to say that it was young people playing video games and it was making us all violent and just stabbing each other. <laughs> And if we look very closely here, let's look at the, the skin color. For weird saying that, but you know, just, just bear with me. I'm looking at this and I'm seeing a lot of white boys. This is really important to note. This is 2005, right? At this point, the perception, the rhetoric around knife crime, it was being labeled as a general youth problem. Not white, not black, but a youth problem. However, very slowly and subtly, this youth problem became more and more portrayed as an inner city black problem. The black community need to be mobilized in denunciation of this gang culture, but we won't stop this by pretending that it isn't young black kids doing it. Tom Reese Price. Tom. I definitely don't like when politicians speak on gangs. Y'all, the reason they're there. 
The original and Lisa Chicago, the original the original reason for gangs was to protect their own from the police because they weren't doing no protecting or they were they were out there harming. So I mean was a rich white lawyer killed in North London by two black men. This case became an obsession of the media. They would not stop reporting about this case. The newspapers would, would explain that he was smartly dressed, that he was a high-flying individual, a city lawyer. The coverage of this case in the media was so disproportionate that it led to the new police commissioner by the name of Ian Blair. He accused the media of institutionalized racism. His argument being that on the same day, several other people who were not white but were from different ethnic backgrounds were murdered on the same day and all they got was one paragraph on page 97. By the end of 2006 discussion in the public sphere increased around knife crime in relation to black communities and I think there is a reason. Man, great example of systemic racism that's great. It's unfortunate that that lawyer lost his life but that is a great example of what the media be doing. Reason for this have to have a, a large system behind you to push an agenda, especially one as big as racism. So. Remember, 30 years ago, there was quite a number of squats here, broken down houses. Now these houses probably go for something like um, £400,000, I would have thought. In the mid to late 2000s, London had seen increased gentrification. This is like, you know, fucking middle class Michael and his family have moved into London. But with that, we were now starting to see that the middle class was living in closer physical proximity to more deprived neighbourhoods. The same paper references a man by the name of Gilligan. He said that violent confrontations were not more likely, only more likely to involve the middle classes and therefore more likely to be reported. The increased visibility of this crime would create a perception that this is a growing crime. We're seeing it more and more. And these videos and, you know, very selective reporting might have been skewing the perception of who was doing these crimes. So you're going to be getting searched now for any weapons or oh, you, um, objects, okay? Name me nine. And this is why I, I, like stop and search was so wild to me. Because it was placed in these neighborhoods and it was carried out in certain neighborhoods and it just looked wild. Like it, it was like telling the police, let your prejudices go. Let your prejudices reign free. I'm not going to call you racist, but let your prejudices reign free and do what you feel is right. <clears throat> due to your moral standpoint and what you've been through. Like, of course, there were probably guidelines put into place, but do you think any of these cops is feeling that, understanding that or doing that? No, come on now. Anybody can look suspicious. You're wearing a certain thing. You're walking with a certain pep in your step. You're with one or two people. Like, you're getting stopped and searched. Like, come on now. If you're talking louder than a certain decibel like black people normally do, <laughs> you're getting stopped and searched. You know what I'm saying? It's as simple as that. Like, I, I never really liked stopped and searched. Like, okay, it did a job, but it just gave police just too much. Too much. This is like free harassment card. Here's your harassment cards for the day. Use them as you please. Like, uh, that's tough. So you're going to be getting searched now for any weapons or oh, you are. Um, okay, name me knives. Crimes. So you're going to be getting searched now for any weapons or oh, you are. Um, okay, name me knives. At least you just come back from a strip search. Why are you not doing Listen, this, you're bro? detained for a section one page search. Reason? My name is Pete. See what I'm saying? Like, like what's the reason? Like, if you're going to do a strip a search on me, like, do you know how... Bro, when you're literally minding your business walking down the street... And he don't got nobody with him. He looked like he just walking down the street. He just dressed a certain way. Do you know how that feels inside? Like, you literally feel helpless. You want to break down and, and probably cry. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, what have I done? Like, that's that's the feeling you got inside. And a lot of people will be like, oh, you waffling. You don't know. Well, this, this, and that. Well, this, this, and that. Well, get out of your bubble. You're in an unrealistic bubble where you have... <laughs> That where you not where you haven't seen the rest of the world and how we live, but like it's like bro, like this is too much. 
You have to have some a reasonable suspicion to search me. America don't do this, but not that I've ever seen. I ain't never seen nobody get stopped and searched in America. It's just like, oh, under section blah, 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 you're getting stopped. Like, well, huh, bro, I'll sue the hell out of you. This is unconstitutional. <laughs> We often see across the media and social my, my fault. And then another thing people like to say, well, if you're not hiding anything, just let them search you. Well, bro, what? Imagine an officer knocks on your door and you've done nothing. The home that you pay for, let's, let's put it as the home that you've paid for, that you pay your taxes, you pay your monthly, whatever you need to pay. All your bills is paid. You just living life, chilling. Officer knocks on your door. Oh yeah, under section blah blah blah. We're here to search your house. Like that's how it feels. Like oh, do you have a warrant? No, I don't have a warrant. But under section, we can do that. Like that's how I'm feeling. It's an invasion of privacy, an invasion of like space, like everything. Social media, etc. A hyper focus on. London. Your drunk bald uncle might share on his Facebook a, a thing like this. Two thirds of knife offenders under 25 were black or minority ethnic. So with that statistic specifically, it is true that two thirds of the people in London who were found possessing a knife, they were black or minority ethnic. However, when we understand that 46% of Londoners are black or minority ethnic, it starts to make a little bit more sense because we might also understand Understand that black minority ethnic people are more likely to be from more deprived neighborhoods in London. And knowing that London is central to UK drug trafficking, gang culture, and has a very high population density. And also, let's just bloody remember that we're talking about possession. The viral Facebook post will say, knife offenses to make you think we're talking about stabbings but we're talking about possession where black and minority ethnic groups are 4.1 times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people and thus if you're searching black and minority ethnic groups four times more than white people yeah, you might find more knives on them. But just, you know, to tie this whole thought together, the vast majority of knife crime offenses in the UK are done by white people. However, this isn't the convenient mental image that the media tends to portray when we say the phrase knife crime use. We have a major problem with black gangs. Rival black gangs are killing each other. Where we begin today in the United Kingdom, where a new highly critical report looking into knife crime has found the government's response completely inadequate. Two thousands onwards, everyone's scared their little billies are going to get stabbed going to the shops. And so a general pressure grew on the police and politicians to do something. And we started to hear, particularly in England, a more tough on crime type of rhetoric. If you're carrying 10, if you're using 20, and if you do end up killing someone, it's life behind the door without parole. You'll take your final breath in jail and we would see the controversial use of section six man let's not even forget like most people carrying knives have been scared into skip carrying knives either by bullying either by potential um grooming or by the media they have been scared into carrying the knives to protect themselves they have no intention of using it in an offensive manner just to defend themselves now, I, I do understand it is illegal to defend yourself in the UK. It's, it feels like, <laughs> like you, you can't do anything out there, but. 60 searches. It's like stop and search. This means that a copper can just point at anyone for no reason and say, hey, your fam, run me your pockets, yeah? And so the increased attention and more proactive police response can, of course, make it seem like it's a growing phenomenon. But, you know, we're balanced people. We're balanced people here. So we, we have to ask the question, are knives being used more in proportion or are we just now more aware of this thing and better at reporting and recording it? And this is a much harder question to answer. We can try and work it out by looking at like homicide statistics. The second part stats for overall knife offenses and possession but the best one really to look at is hospital admissions for knife wounds you know it's harder to fudge those numbers you either have a hole in your body from a knife or you don't this graph shows us that a general trend of knife crime happened to peak at 2004 to 2005 but then there's a dip all the way down to 2014 and we hit a low point which is weird phrasing because morally it's a high point but you know you get what i'm saying knife crime and homicide in general reached a record low around this period and some people started to think that the knife crisis 
crisis was over. And then it just went, nope. This graph cuts out, but recent data will show that it seemed to have peaked in 2019 and then dropped, obviously due to COVID, and then has grown recently, but is still under the peak of 2019. So it just seems if we're to compare it to general homicide stats, it seems that the percentage that knives were specifically used seems to keep relatively constant and kind of just mirroring the rough peaks of general homicide in the country. No investments for the young people. Community centers being closed down. And that's what I was, I was just talking about this earlier, man. If I could, if I ever came up on money, man, I would just go to random neighborhoods and open community centers. And, but I would make sure they're in my name so you can't change anything that's done. Like on all of these days, kids will be in here to be able to come. They'll be able to do what they need to do. They'll be able to stay out of trouble. They'll be able to have resources. They'll be able to do do what they need to do to stay up out the streets and stay away from being bored and having an idle mind. <clears throat> no emotional support. The thing about a lot of the community centers, man, they, they get money hungry and they start renting out the gyms to do stupid stuff, like play badminton. Like, like go, some, go to a country club and play that. Like, why you go to the middle of the hood to play... To play <laughs> badminton like what is that even support for our young people so if we look at this chart it shows us the causes of knife crime and if we were to add up street violence fights gang attacks it kind of comes to about 38 percent of all knife crimes so with all that in mind it's a perfect time for us to ask the next question why do people stab each other so i'm going to present a few of the theories that people have around knife crime and crime in general now for instance a lot of pundits love to talk about multiculturalism and how that is what causes all crime on earth ever and they do this because of the correlation between the rise of immigration and the rise of crime murder and knife crime etc but that's only like sort of true it's like you know a quarter of the story in the year 2022 when we had our peak of immigration where we had 745,000 immigrants into the country our murder rate in the country was 11.5 knife hospital admissions were 3,775 but then we have a little problem because if we go back to 2006 and 7 where we have 322,000 so you know under half of the immigrants coming into the country our murder rate was at 14.1 and knife admissions to hospital were 5,720 so if it was simply a case that immigration multiculturalism means more murders well it should map on pretty much perfectly to the statistics and it doesn't so then we have to go into the claim that it's something to do with sort of the lack of religion and breakdown of cultural values as well as not being as harsh they tell you whatever they think and they, pu they push they push it they, they push a certain they pushing the stereotypes, man. The media is crazy, man. On punishment. So, you know, you can point at somewhere like the UAE. Very strict, very religious, very harsh punishments, and they have a very low murder rate. But then, my friends, what about Mexico? It's just South America in general. You try to tell me they're not very, very religious, and they don't have very strict laws. Of course, that's insane, but they have the highest murder rate on Earth. And even... Yeah, somebody in Mexico will murder you and then go play, pray to whatever angel and be forgiven they feel people like myself that would more often point to inequality and that how worsening inequality generally maps onto crime and homicide even that perspective isn't perfect Qatar is very unequal but has very low crime and murder this is a very highly religious country and very strict on punishment so that might tilt your scale towards thinking it's all about religion and strict laws but then what about Norway Norway is very equal it's very equal society relatively they are less religious or at least they're less strict about religion they are famously very soft on punishment when it comes to crime however they too are low crime and low murder so from all that we can Man, the quality of life though in norway is outstanding <laughs> the quality of life in qatar is outstanding that's that that'd be a part of it the quality of life that these people is living like i ain't gotta do all this the, my quality of life is high even if i'm bumming it around here it's beautiful <clears throat> simple conclude i don't know what can we fucking just fucking confuse it don't worry my friends we can work this out i grew up in poverty you know i was always looking for a way of providing for myself or sourcing an income or sourcing some sort of money to maintain a certain status 
amongst my friends. So from what I could figure out from all this research, and it is confusing, I ain't gonna lie, is that from what I can tell, it seems to be a mix between cultural social values, inequality, and a trust in your country's institutions and social order. My friend is dead, yeah? And this is what we're doing to support him, yeah? Look what they're doing, look. However, when you're fucking, when you're scrolling through Twitter and every pundit is trying to say that it's a cultural issue, it's culture, culture, and they kind of imply that it's purely a problem of morality. It completely ignores the responsibility of capitalism and inequality of creating that culture in the first place. In the 80s, we saw a massive rise in unemployment and inequality. And as you'd expect in this Thatcher era, we would see a massive rise in crime and murder rates. That's like, you know, if you're putting this mad pressure on everyone, the government's never going to be held accountable. They don't want to, they're going to scapegoat everything. Oh, it ain't us. It's this, that, and the third happening. Um, to, they need to be wealthy to matter specifically young men who you know biologically and socially are probably more conditioned towards violence and taking risks they're gonna look around at their life and see god i'm never gonna get a fucking job in an office and so some will make a decision to take a shortcut to try and make money some of those young men not all will be looking around and seeing who is the high status person in my community and if that person is the drug dealer and he's carrying a knife you might be inspired to do the same same thing and so this creates just a vicious spiral that's really hard to undo why do you carry a 15 inch knife because it's big and you get them scared i said like, i know this is pretty depressing but come on there must be please god there must be some solution there must be a light at the end of the tunnel right well my friends we have to head over to glasgow no, i'm sorry I'm sorry. It weren't good, I know. If you step out into the housing estates, there's a trend of binge drinking, knife carrying, a willingness to use that knife. In 2005, Scottish people were three times more likely to be murdered than in England and Wales. But somehow Glasgow reduced, massively reduced knife crime uh, by doing something just unthinkable, which was solving the root causes. They took a different attitude. They wanted to treat knife crime as a health problem as opposed to just a purely criminal one. And so in Scotland, they took a mixed approach, right? So they did make the, the sentences and the, the punishments harsher. The average sentence for carrying a knife tripled. But whilst doing that, they combined it by focusing on like high risk youth, kids from certain areas that are just statistically more likely to end up carrying a knife. And they would would work very closely and very voluntarily with them. They wouldn't force them to do anything. They would give them lots of guidance. They would, they would talk to them about the risks of their lifestyle, as well with helping them with housing, relocation, job opportunities, employment training, and just having close communication with them. If they had a problem, they could speak to the, the, these people. But it's very interesting to look at Glasgow in the case of multiculturalism. As Glasgow got more racially diverse, you know, more multiculturalism, knife crime came down. And now look, Glasgow hasn't completely solved knife crime. They still have some, but it is far down from where it was. And especially if we compare their response to England and Wales and where we're at versus them, yeah, we fucked up. Tyson Fury has called on the government to introduce tougher punishments for knife crime, comparing it to a pandemic. He said, this is becoming ridiculous. Idiots carry knives. This needs to stop. In England, what you hear an awful lot is talking about punishment. More stop and search, stricter laws, put them in jail for longer. However, all of that while sounding very logical, that means more prison time, more policing, more legal costs, all of which means much more money. And think about this. One million for a murder uh, trial, okay, to put one guy away. If we had that million, how many young lives could we save? If we look at the YEF toolkit, which sort of analyzes all the different ways you can deal with crime, how much it costs and how effective it is, the approaches that work the best seem to cost the most. This pisses me off about England, but I really think that that is the main issue. That's everything. Healthier food to lose weight costs a lot more than cheap food to stay fat <laughs> that's just life and it's sad really it just costs